So thank you for the introduction and also for this uh, invitation. It's my great pleasure to present you what we are doing in the combined entity, I would say, so Artanim and Dreamscape, I was just explained. So I will present you today like a kind of journey from research where everything starts, uh, the development of the VR platform for about four years, to Dreamscape, so the VR entertainment uh, company. So let's go back a little bit in the past, so about uh, three years ago when the first Oculus uh, development kit uh, came out. This is where we uh, start working on the virtual reality uh, topic. And in fact, we can start from there. When you look at the pictures, that was the kind of experience that was proposed at that time. So as you can see, you have one user, is lonely, is connected to the computer, you cannot really interact with the virtual world. You don't have controller as we have right now, for example. But also, you cannot move in the virtual space. So if I want to move in the virtual space, either I need to have like a joystick, you know, and most of the time you get very easily motion thickness because you have a disconnection between your brain somehow or between the ear that stay at the same place and the visual get goes fast in the headset. So this is typically the kind of experience that we wanted to avoid. What we wanted to do is this, the holodex. So I think like this reference, everybody knows it from uh, the Star Trek. So the idea is really to just open the door, be in a virtual environment, and your body will be the complete interface between the physical world and the virtual world. So we look at something that was much more, I would say, natural. Really, like your body is in interface, the technology should be completely transparent. Of course, it's, it's not it's going to be like completely transparent for sure, but we need to have some tech as well in order to immerse a user uh, in the virtual world. But that was our objectives. Here, also, I wanted to focus on this part because locomotion is one very important aspect to us. We were a motion capture company, so really making research on this field, so motion is something that really interests us. And as you can see on these pictures, so that was possibilities to integrate uh, walking, for example, in virtual space. But uh, you have, in fact, uh, if you don't recognize the kind of system, uh, you have a, a nominee-directional uh, treadmill, so, so you were somehow attached to this machine, so it's a little bit cumbersome as well, and not, again, really natural. So what is more natural than simply walking? So this is what we wanted to integrate. So starting from the motion capture, combining the two technology, and again, now you see more and more setup that integrate the two, but here I'm talking about uh, more than three years ago. So our idea was really to combine a motion tracking system with the VR headset. So the first step we did was, was with the full body, uh, you know, suit, so a thousand markers. So the setup is not very easy. In particular, if you want to offer public experience, so you don't want to have like people having like a 15 minute setup to have all the markers, but at least you have a very good tracking in terms of body animation. So we had to think about it, but that was the first test at the beginning, combining the two technologies. What guide our development? So now I will focus this presentation on two, uh, on four, sorry, uh, specific, specific aspects. So we came with this philosophy, what, did, what make the presence in VR? What is it so important? For us, there are four pillars. The first one is the illusion of being in a stable space. Of course, now with the technology that we have on the commercial uh, markets, so the VR headset provide you consistent graphic, because if you look back like, I don't know, 10 years ago, I mean, the technology was not very ready, so you had easily motion thickness. Now we have the great technology, but it's not enough. There are two other aspects that need uh, to be solved as well. It's accurate tracking, so now we have also a lot of different devices that provide you motion tracking of your body movement and so on, and also a very low latency. So if you look at our system, so you have one example here showing exactly what I'm talking about. So you have two users that are all connected wirelessly, so there is no cable, nothing at all. So all the system work in wireless. You have motion capture cameras. We don't see it so much over here, but there are some uh, cameras around uh, the scene, and you see that the two people are able to 
toss objects to each other, so here it's the torch, for example, and to achieve this, you need to have like a very accurate system because the information needs to be tracked by the system, uh, analyzed, post-processed, and the information sent to the user. The rendering needs to be made as well in the VR headset in order to get the information and to catch the objects. So obviously, a few milliseconds, but no more, otherwise you have uh, some uh, bad artifacts, and you will miss the torch for sure. Another example is this one. So you see me uh, playing tennis. I was former professional playing player, so I was very interesting to see if it was able, if it was possible to make a tennis uh, uh, practice. I mean in VR. So the ball is also tracked in this uh, video, tracked by the motion capture system. Somebody is throwing me the balls, and then I'm able to hit the ball. So again, it's another example where you need to be very precise, but with a very low latency system. The second aspect in, in, in VR to get great VR experience is self-embodiment. I think yesterday we got a lot of different uh, talk, interesting talk in neuroscience explaining why self-embodiment was an important aspect to really believe that you are somewhere else in space. So I will not talk about this aspect, but I just show you another example on this video. For the people that have fear of height, for example, on this part, when you see it here in the video, of course, if you don't see your feet, for example, you won't have exactly the same feeling as if you are you know, hesitating because you see yourself. So again, having the body completely immersed as a full body tracking, and not only the head or the hands when you have controllers and so on, it's very important for this aspect. Of course, you don't want to have your people to have all the time, you know, a full motion capture suit, as I was mentioning before, because it takes time, and also if you want to install that in public environment, in terms of hygiene and so on, it starts to be a little bit tricky. So, one of the technical challenges was to come up with an easy solution, so more, much more simpler. The idea was to have only uh, some part of the body that were tracked by the motion capture system. So on our case, we are tracking, of course, the head, to have the po head position and orientation in space. We are also tracking the pelvis, the hands, and the feet. And based on that, using inverse kinematic algorithm, we are able to uh, recalculate the full body animation in real time. So that's a trick. Of course, the animation is a little bit uh, less accurate than if you have the full body motion capture suit, of course, because we are tracking every joint of the body. In our case, we are only tr having six tracking points, but that's enough to make you believe that the body that you are controlling, or your avatar you are controlling, is accurate enough in this simulation. The third uh, important aspect is the illusion of touching things, I will say, physical interaction. Here you have a, a very uh, nice example. Again, it's a whole, very old system, because you see the very old um, uh, VR headset at that moment. It's an image courtesy of EPFL VR Lab. It was the haptic chair. That was one of the first simulations I tried to touch you know, uh, um, things in VR. And I think it's, again, another aspect that makes you believe that you are somewhere else or you are in a truly uh, a virtual simulation. So, of course, this is not something that you can use. Have like it's again a very cumbersome system. But you have some different uh, possibilities or devices that you can use. I just select a few examples. You have, for example, uh, gloves like this. Because there are two important aspects when we are talking about haptics: is the sensation of touch. It's one aspect, and the second aspect is to have the force feedback. So, for example, if I squeeze a ball, I need to have the force feedback as well. So, with such gloves, you can have this kind of feeling. There is another new, very new uh, example. This one, they are using EMG, so it's electromyography. So, they provide electric signal to your muscle to get the information of ah, something happened, I'm touching a wall or something like that. There are some other possibilities. You could uh, use a robot, that's the case here, that provide you the force feedback when you are touching something. Or there are some uh, more typical uh, devices that we find in the entertainment, which are the haptics vests that provide you some sensation. For example, if you are in a shooting game and so on, and somebody tries to shoot you, you will feel uh, the sensation. 
This is not what we integrate, in fact, our system. Again, we want to have the technology as much as possible transparent. So our idea was, OK, I have hands, I can touch things, so why not tracking objects in the physical world and to be able to interact with it? So this is what you can see on this image. For example, you see the two users. Uh, they are interacting with well, physical object that needs to be like not very interesting here, but uh, that they're, they're in fact in the scenario uh, on this video, you are uh, you have to find crystals to uh, get teleported using the machine over here. So you have to put crystals together in a small hole, and you see that the crystal they have also markers on top. So we are tracking the position of those physical objects, and you have the virtual counterparts in the simulation. So again, we make the selection of having like a very natural interaction without adding uh, too much technologies. And this is what we call passive haptics. The last uh, aspect I wanted to talk about was, of course, the social communication. Most of the uh, VR experience that you can try right now, it's generally it's a lonely experience. You are completely alone. There are more and more possibilities to synchronize, for example, to different uh, vibe systems and so on. But I mean, most of the time, it's a lonely experience. Again, what we believe is like, it's much better, it's much more fun if we can make VR together, for example. So our main also aspect of research was to be able to have multiple users at the same time, it could be two, three, four persons at the same time. But of course, we need to also develop the technological environment, so the network architecture that goes around, so that everything is perfectly synchronized between the user. Otherwise, you would get, you know, you are working and then you can collide to each other. So you need to be, again, uh, very precise on that aspect. So in summary, our vision is there. So using the motion capture system, we are able to have a full body immersion, to be able also to track people in larger spaces. Again, what we are targeting with this system is not spaces like, for example, the Vive, where we are limited to uh, three by three meters. In that case, it can be much more bigger, like 100 meter square uh, spaces or even more. The other thing is that we want to combine the real life stage set, so to have pieces of decors or objects you can interact with, and the visual, I mean, virtual counterpart in the environment, so to be able to interact uh, with physical objects. I will just quickly show you the video. So that was one of the first demos we did and that we present uh, last year at the Sundance Fizz Festival. So just to give you uh, feeling when you have all the aspects together. There are some sounds normally, but otherwise it's okay. So you see the two users, they have a kind of mission, I would say, when they have to find crystals that are hidden in the geometries in the room. And when you find the two crystals, you have to insert them together in the teleportation machine to get teleported to the next scene. It's a really basic scenario, but that's forced the people to collaborate together. And we also played, for example, to have other virtual characters around you because it's really funny. The dancers, for example, when they are uh, coming like too close from yourself, we see that the user, this is, I mean, how you can really fool the brain because they forgot that they are completely virtual and they try to avoid the characters when they are coming closer. So just showing that VR is a very, very powerful medium uh, to fool your brain somehow. So we present uh, this first prototype that we develop uh, from a research project at Artanim at several festivals and conferences. And we had so much success that we thought, why not uh, trying to go a little bit uh, further in that? Mm, it's not working, but whatever. Uh, to go further in that and to try to commercialize the solution for the VR entertainment industry. And this is where uh, Dreamscape was born as a spin-off of Artenim Foundation and uh, targeting this kind of aspect. So what we want to do with VR uh, in this company, it's this, in fact, is to open several uh, VR multiplex. So it's, uh, it's really realistic. So the first launch of the first VR multiplex will be uh, the next uh, four. Uh, in Los Angeles, in the Century Mall of Westfield, for the people that know Los Angeles a little bit, so it's a strategic location as well. So the idea will be like for a cinema, so you will buy a ticket, choose the VR experience that you like, and experience it. 
uh, that's the business uh, model we have in, bus in uh, Dreamscape. So the first location would be in Los Angeles, but then the idea is to spread and to scale uh, fast to open different uh, locations around the world. What we want to provide in terms of experiences uh, compared to our main competitors, for example, like the Void or Zero Latency, we are not targeting experience that are uh, for first-person shooter. That's something really we want to avoid, is really to provide cinematic experiences where the people do something together. They are more explorers than players in that case. Uh, you just see some example here, but we are currently working on the content that we will present for the first uh, launch. But really, that's the target. And also to touch a larger audience, because when you do first-person shooter, for example, it's you, are, you will touch maybe uh, the younger people and also the men. In my case, I don't like it so much. So I would prefer to do something more uh, contemplatory. So that's one of the targets. Uh, to achieve this, we have uh, we are very lucky because we just uh, closed our round A of investors. And as you can see, we uh, managed to have like very strategic uh, people in our uh, side, uh, and in particular in the Hollywood uh, studios. So we have MGM, Fox, for example, and, uh, M uh, and Warner uh, in our side, uh, trying also to be able to get access to IPs and to provide such experience uh, for the opening. We have also these guys, I don't need to introduce him, but he was also very uh, well surprised when he tried the system, and it's also one of our investors. So if you don't have the time to experience our system uh, yet, you have the possibilities uh, to do it uh, here, in fact. So you just need to book your slots through the system, but I think there are some slots free for uh, tomorrow. So do not hesitate to come to us. Thank you very much.